University of Jerusalem, and uh, she's going to speak on concatenation of cubic structure and application to facts. Thank you. <coughs> ah, it's great to be here in Jerusalem. No, I'm here all the time. <laughs> um, that was my joke for Mikrosham. <laughs> I don't know if I'll give a proof. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the motivating question that, uh, of my talk is uh, the following uh, question, uh, number theoretic question. Um, so suppose we're given a, a collection of polynomials, P1 through Pk with integer coefficients. And um, we're looking for patterns of the form x, x plus p1 of, uh, okay, n, k, n. And we're looking for such patterns where all of them are simultaneously prime. So all of these are prime. Um, yeah, so p will be prime from <coughs> now on. Uh, right. So, um, so there are two questions we want to ask. First is the, uh, the existing questions. Does the prime, do, do the primes contain such configurations? And the second one, if, um, if they do, then, uh, uh, then how many? Um, can we, can we uh, try to find some asymptotics for the number of such configurations? So, um, so the baseline, so maybe, maybe two examples that I'll take that will follow with me is uh, say you're looking for a configuration of the form x, x plus n, x plus n squared, or something like x, x plus n squared, x plus 2n squared, and you can add some constants if you want around. So we're not looking at only at, uh, uh, polynomials with a zero constant coefficient. And the reason I say that is the following. So, so about 10 years ago, um, Tao and I, uh, Prove the following theorem: uh, uh, the primes contain if if p i of zero is equal to zero for all i, then the primes contain um, progressions of the form. As I, as I wrote before. So this, this type of pattern, x, x plus p1 of n, x plus pk of n. Um, this theorem um, makes crucial use of, uh, of a, uh, what is known as the, so this makes crucial use of what is known as the polynomial Semiretti theorem that was proved by Bergelson and Leibman. And um, it's one of the triumphs of the ergodic Ramsey theory. So this theorem doesn't have a combinatorial proof to this day, and, um, and this theorem is based on, and, uh, based on the uh, ergodic theoretic or <laughs> the ergodic theoretic polynomial Semiretti theorem, which is initiated in um, Furstenberg's proof <coughs> of Semiretti's theorem. So, so makes use of the bergelson leibman leibman polynomial Semiretti theorem, <laughs> which in turn is, is based on, or was born out of, born, I don't know how to say this, uh, from ergodic Ramsey theory. Which is the baby of Persenberg, or <laughs> Persenberg. Um, initiated by Furstenberg, um, and Furstenberg's proof of Semiretti's theorem. So this is, this is one baseline, so if the PIs are all, don't have cost and coefficients, PI zero is zero, then, then we have the existence problem, but we don't know what, how to deal with the problem if there are no, so this, this theorem is, is true only, the polynomial Semiretti theorem is true only if we have, uh, if we don't allow any constant coefficients. Um, so this is one thing, and the second, so, so my baseline, this is one baseline for the existence problem for this type of polynomials, and for the asymptotics question, the second baseline um, is a theorem uh, with uh, Green and Tau. So the, if pi are all linear, uh, then, then we understand, then have asymptotics. 
So, so there should be some conditions. So if pi could be all constant, and then I would be hiding some twin prime question or something like that. So I'm non-trivial. So pi non-constant, and pi <coughs> minus pj is not constant, non-constant. Um, but the question is, the question that after, after this theorem, the question is, can we, can we answer it? Can we give this type of, understand this type of question? Um, for uh, for nonlinear polynomials, so this is the motivation, and uh, at last we have some progress on this. Um, so I w let me let me describe to you first. Um, so what is the first approach to to a problem with polynomials? So the first approach, um, so first step, um, is um, uh, a linearization process that was um, initiated or first described by Bergelson, what is called the pet induction, pet induction, which allows you, this allows one to replace a, a polynomial array in one variable. So if you start with P1 through PK, <coughs> these are in ZX, you can replace this with uh, multilinear, so these were polynomials in one variable, and this is a multilinear array <coughs> of, of polynomials, Q1 through QL in some D variables. So typically, this would be much larger than, um, this would be much larger than K, and the D here would be the degree of the largest polynomial over here. Um, so, so what do I mean by allows one to replace? So, so I want to take a, so, so for example, um, in the case of the, of the triple, or let me, in the case of the array n, n squared, or if you want zero n, n squared. So n, n squared, this is for this, for this question that I have over here. Um, in in order to understand this question, one can study the question of the array of, of, of multilinear polynomials of the form nk, nm, n, k plus m. Okay, so, so these are all linear polynomials or multilinear polynomials, but in more variables. And, and I want to describe first, tell you, so in what, in what sense do I mean that I can study this instead of study this? So, so how, do, how do we approach this problem? Well, we first start by, uh, we, we want to find these configurations, so we start by trying to count them, the number of such configurations inside the set we're interested in. So, so suppose we have some set A of integers. So suppose our set A is in the integers from 1 to n, so this is 1 to n. And what we want to do is we want to count um, how many elements, how many triples we can find which are of the form x, x plus n, x plus n squared. So you want to count the number of these. <coughs> so we sum <coughs> and um, we let x range up to n. So if we're interested in this question of finding squares and we want it to be meaningful, then the range we should take n is to be up to square root n. If we want it to be comparable with the range of x, so n would go up to square root n, and we would divide by n square root n, and this is the expression we want to study. So um, let me replace this, or from now on I'll replace this thing. I'll rewrite this as this is the, the notation that we use um, as an average so when I write this this uh, expectation notation here what I mean is I average over whatever I write underneath so in this case I'm averaging I'm averaging th this is this is the same as this I'm just replacing this thing by this notation and from now on when I write this and I write something underneath it's an average so this is this is what I want to study or in general what I want to study is this same expression but with say th three different functions here fgh and it, what does this arrow mean over here well it would mean the following that either so um, 
arrow. So this means um, another blackboard. Either um, let me let me describe let me write that h let's write the average of h to be delta. So suppose that I look at the third function h and suppose the average of the function h is delta. Then the the statement that I mean by this arrow over here would be that either this expression over here, either what I'm looking for f of x g of x plus n, h of x plus n squared is asymptotically the same as delta times the average over f of x, g of x plus n. So this is x smaller or equal than n, and n smaller or equal than square root n, and the same over here. So Either I can replace h by its expected value, by its, by its um, average, or in which case I'm happy because this is a simpler average that I can try to evaluate. And in fact, in the case of the primes, I can evaluate this, this average in this range. So either this happens or, um, or this, this, this other multilinear average kicks in. Or this average, the average over f of x, oh, sorry. Um, I'll write this and then explain. H of tilde of x, H tilde of x plus n, m. Or this average is bounded away from zero. So this expression over here would be some constant depending on, on this delta, but it's bounded, uh, bounded away from zero um, where um, I need to explain two things. First, I want to explain the range for this thing. So the range over here, I it's very, the, it's the, in, all, in this question, the range of the parameters is crucial. And, and, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute why. But the range here is x goes up to n, but all other parameters go up to square root n. So that makes sense. So this would be of order n as well. And the function h tilde is just a normalized function. So h tilde is just h minus its expected value. OK, I normalize the function h. This is the function of integral or of sum 0. And, and either, either I, can, I, I can evaluate a simpler average, like this one over here, or I have this, um, this kind of condition, this kind of average of the function h that behaves, that is bounded away from 0. So I want to try to, uh, let's take a look at this average. And um, let me show you a sister average, or uh, I don't know, a, a nice, yeah? Greater, greater. This is just notation. So some constant depending on delta. Depending on, on delta and depending on how close this is over here. So bounded, I think of n as being huge. Delta is some fixed number. And OK, delta, delta. Um, OK. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, if I, I, I'm, ch I'm slightly cheating. If I wrote this thing in the correct form, which would involve slightly more parameters, then this would be obviously this would be a square of something which would be positive. So um, I'll, I'll write this, and it's uh, everything is there's a slight cheat in everything, but but the the, the I, I I already have m many more parameters than I want. Uh, so um, Okay, so either, either this happens or, or this, and, and the question, what, what we want to understand is how can we interpret this, this condition? So first of all, I want to show you, and this is why, why the range of the parameters is crucial, and why, um, uh, so, so, let, so let me describe, let me show you a very closely related average that is very easily understood. So suppose I was looking at the same average, saying the same h tilde, but I was looking at h of x, h of x plus m, h of x plus k. Sorry? First you just calculate delta from h. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. This is this is 
yeah, I'm just, I just wanted to write it in this formulation of replacing this by that. That's, that's all. I can't do this for all the other functions. So this would not be true for, for these functions g and, I, g, and e, g and f over here because the range of n is too small. But the fact that the range here is maximal allows me to do this replacement. Um, okay, so, so I claim that this average, so if, if I look at this average... It's very similar in form to this one over here. It looks almost the same, only, only in, in this case over here. Um, I have these parameters m and k, and they're all large. They're all of scale n. Then this is very well understood. This is by, by discrete Fourier analysis. It's a one-line calculation. Um, we, we, we find that h tilde has a large... Fourier coefficient which we interpret as h which is the same as saying that h tilde of x e to the 2 pi i alpha x e to the um, this thing is large bounded away from zero, okay? So everything depends on this parameter delta that is calculated from h, yeah, thank you. So if, if this type of average is very, this studied for a long time, it's very easy to understand. It's governed by the Fourier coefficients of the function h, but <coughs> the, the, the point is that over here, we don't, the, the, if you try to apply Fourier analysis to this average, you immediately see that, you, that you, you're stuck, okay? So, so wh whoever of you that has experience with these expressions, you'd see that you, you immediately um, get stuck. And the question is, um, how can I think of this? I can think of this, so I fix and I look at this, this I, I, the, the, we think of these as cubic averages. So I have this point zero here, I have m here, I have k here, and I have an m plus k sitting here at the top, and I, I have these kind of distorted cubes that are multiplied by this n, and in various directions in n, I have this type of linear behavior. So let me call this, this, this type of, so if this thing is, is bounded away from zero, so this is, if, if this is large, then, so this type of average is large implies, so star large, star large implies, um, H behaves, H tilde in this case, behaves, let me call this, behaves linearly along the interval n. Okay, so I'll think of this as, or not behaves or exhibits linear behavior. It's not exactly behaves, just correlation with something linear, but, but let me call it behaves linearly just to save some, some words. So if, if this average is large, then H has some linear behavior along the full progression n, the full interval n. However, what the, the information that I have here, I can use locally. So I can fix an n and use the same kind of Fourier analysis. And what I would get is that along from, 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 from double star, the information I can get from here The information from double star implies that H behaves linearly along um, n m, m small or equal than square root n for many n. Okay, I have these distorted cubes that are, that are scaled by this n, and I have many directions like this on which I have some linear behavior, but it could be different, different alpha for each one of these directions. And what I want to understand is, can I find, does this thing hide some global information about the function f? Can I find some, does, does this mean some, so does it have some, uh, uh, does it incorporate some global information about f? So the question is, um, question, um, can we get, get from this uh, global? So global for me means scale n information 
on on my function um, on my function h tilde. Can I can I get anything global about uh, on 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 um, on this h tilde? And the answer will be yes, and I'll, I will describe it soon. But let me just let me just say um, what is the form of the answer I'm looking at. So if I look at these, if I, if I know that this is true for many for many n's, I have a linear behavior along this progression n m. Then so the first idea or oh, idea starting point is find I can find generic n and n prime such that. Well, I can find n and n prime, generic n and n prime would, would satisfy this. I can find n and n prime such that, let me call this progression hn, such that hn plus hn prime, so I look at the sum of these two progressions, then of, they are of order n, They're, the, the size of this set as, as a sum set is, is of order n, um, and the multiplicity is bounded for each for each point with bounded multiplicity, with bounded multiplicity at each point. So this allows me to translate this question. It's a new question. I have this these two progressions together. They form something that is huge of the scale I want. It's scale together they form something of scale n. I have information regarding linear behavior in each one of them. Can I combine the information together to get some, some global information about the function f? So this is what, I, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm asking a question. I know something about the progression hn. I know something about the progression hn prime. And I'm trying to find out some information about the sum of the, t the, sum of the two progressions. So, so before I tell you, before I describe the answer to this, let me describe an ergodic theoretic analog for this for this question. So, so suppose you have, um, you have an ergodic system. So suppose, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. So you have um, uh, G is uh, an abelian countable abelian group. Um, so, so in this case, if I wanted to translate this, this would be like to the question that I have over here. It would, you'd see in a minute, it's, it's, it would correspond to a Z2 action. But let me describe this for a general countable abelian group G. And I have two subgroups, H1 and H2, are subgroups of G. And, uh, and I have a G system. So I have XG is a measure preserver system. And um, and suppose, suppose I have the following situation. Suppose, so, so I have, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe my entire group G acts ergodically. I don't really care at, this, at the moment. But suppose I have some information regarding the H action and some information regarding the, a, the H1 action, some information regarding the H2 action. Can I use the fact, and the, the, two, the two groups commute, can I get some information about the, uh, the, the H1 plus H2 action? So, so suppose, um, so, so here's the simplest case. Suppose um, on uh, H1 ergodic components, uh, the system XH1 is a Kronecker system. So on, er oh yeah, um, the system, uh, not a XH1. So uh, on each ergodic component looks like a Kronecker system, is a Kronecker system. Honecker, maybe K, CK system. <coughs> and similarly, similar, <laughs> similarly uh, for H2. So suppose, suppose my system looks like a chronic reaction in, in, in the H1 direction, like a chronic reaction in H2 direction. What does it, can I say something? Can I say something? Say something. <coughs> about the action in direction H1 plus H, the action on the H1 plus H2 ergodic components. So here's an example. So, so suppose, your, suppose your system X was d cubed. 
the, the, the torus cubed and your, cyst, your, your action, um, you look at the Z2 action given by S and T, and my action is given by X, Y, Z goes to X plus alpha. This is the T action, Y, um, Z plus Y. So on each T ergodic component, this looks like a Kronecker system. And <coughs> the S action is something like this. So on the S component, this looks like, on the uh, S ergodic components, this looks like a, um, this also looks like a Kronecker system. So when X is constant, this is a Kronecker system. But the, the joint system, so as, as a T, S system, this is a system, this is an Abramov system. This is, exhibits quadratic behavior. If I look at the, this is the system is an Abramov system. A two-step. So it exhibits a, a quadratic behavior. Okay, so automatically the question is not, so if I have linear behavior in one direction and linear behavior in the other direction, then I can at least expect quadratic behavior in, in, in the joint direction. And, um, and what we can show is that uh, uh, in some sense, this is, this is, uh, this is what happens. Um, so let me first formulate this, the question, this question in a more precise manner. Um, so, right. So here is a uh, here is a definition. Uh, maybe some of you have seen before. Let me introduce the the U two norms for um, for uh, uh, for G action. So so suppose uh, I have a G X is a is a system, a measure preserving system, and I have some subgroup H. I can define what is the U two norm of a function f f is a bounded function, uh, the U2 norm of a function f to the fourth is defined to be the <laughs> limit of um, 1 over, I'll describe this in a uh, phi m, so uh, phi m is a Fulner sequence in H. I look at 1 over phi m, the sum of H, K, and M in phi M, <coughs> H, K is enough, of the integral of F of X, T, H, F of X, T, K, F of X, T, H plus K, F, D mu. Okay, so I define these, the, the, these U2 norms. You see that they're very, they, they measure something that is very similar to the averages that I wrote before. If I, I, I have the same kind of cubic HK and H plus K that I had in, this, in the average that I had in the combinatorial world. And, um, and here's a theorem of Briggleson is that um, if, uh, if f um, if if x g is ergodic, and so let me write this as u of h, and f u two of a of u two g um, is greater than zero for all bounded function f. Then, so this is a way to recognize a Kronecker system. Then XG is a Kronecker system. Not bounded, not non-zero. So there's a way to recognize a, a Kronecker system via some uniformity on, on, the, on the bounded functions F. So if a system is a Kronecker system if and only if any, any f an ergodic system if and only if any function non-negative, any non-zero <laughs> bounded function has 
non-zero U2 norm, okay? Or these are called the, the U2 norms. Well, it's U2. Um, so here is, here is, uh, here is this, this thing that I wrote over here, or this example that I wrote over here. What can we prove about it? So the theorem in this case would be that, uh, uh, so theorem um, joint work with tau is that um, suppose, so I have the same iteration. I have this G and I have H1 and H2 subgroups of G and G is abelian. And suppose I know that I have this uniformity FU2HI is greater or equal than zero for every um, function f non-zero, uh, then what does this imply that I want to, this is the example that I had over here. So this is the situation that I had over here. I have my two actions, I have, er, uh, I have they're not, my system is not necessarily ergodic in each one of the directions. So I have these two actions, I have linearity in one direction and linearity in the second direction, incorporated in, th in this fact over here that my systems are conical systems and this implies that I know that I can at, at least expect quadratic behavior but we, we already know that, that in many of these questions um, uh, quadratic is not exactly sufficient. What one should look at is nil systems and this implies that um, x uh, on h1 plus h2 ergodic components the system is a two-step pronil system. Okay, so if I have linear behavior in two different directions, then I have nil two-step nil potent with respect the behavior with respect to their joint action. And in, in general, so this the theorem. So this this is <coughs> what happens for this type of example over here. So if I took this thing over here and twisted, I could write any co-cycle I want. I could write here some sigma of y and twist it by some co-boundary, and some tau of x and twist this by some co-boundary. Then this would imply that if these two if these two actions commute, then this, the entire system must be a two-step pronial system. And and in general, this the theorem of Host and Kra which generalizes Bergelson's theorem, which I didn't erase. So, so again, if my system is ergodic, then, and F UK G is greater than zero for all bounded F, then, um, uh, then X is uh, XG, is a k minus one step pronil system. So there's a way to generalize these norms that I wrote over here. So you can try to, to, think, your, to, to think to yourself how you would generalize this. So if I think of this as a two-dimensional cube, I have h, uh, zero, h, k, and h plus k sitting up top, uh, on top over here, then I would add another dimension. This would correspond to the U3 norms. Um, uh, and the theorem of Host and Cross says that if these UK norms are, are greater than zero, then um, um, I should say maybe this is, they prove it for a Z system. So I should write it for, for a Z system, but this, their theorem generalizes, I think was generalized by John Griesmeier to um, ZM systems. Uh, Sorry, did, what did I write? Did I write, ah, greater, yeah, this is, uh, this is always, sorry, thanks. This is, it's always, these, these things are uh, always, uh, if I define them correctly, they should all be always be positive, not negative. Um, and, and in general, so what, what is the general theorem we can prove? Is that if you have, so, so, so in this case, I think of this as if, if I have the theorem, If I have these two subgroups of an abelian group, and I have this property that f u with respect to one group, I am 
be greater than zero. And with respect to the other, for every f, every non-zero bounded f, I have this property in the, uh, for, with respect to the other group, I have k minus 1 nil property or nil behavior in, with respect to h1, l minus 1 nil behavior with respect to h2, then um, f or if I want to formulate this right, so f would be f u k plus l minus 1 um, is greater than 0 for any f non 0 with respect to the h1 plus h2 actions, which is the same as saying that it, in the case, this would be true, this, this would be true for any, without saying anything about describing the norm, the relation between norms and nil actions. I don't need any, I don't, need, we don't need this theorem for this. This is just to intuition for us um, as to what should happen. We think of this as, nil, we know that in these cases we have nilpotent behavior and concatenating the behavior in direction k in direction k l gives behavior in direction k plus l. The, num the, the indices never work here, right? So this is nil behavior in k minus, oh, minus whatever. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's that's a, exactly what a, what what we need. Um, right. So 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 this is the way we, we one wants to think of this is that if you understand the cubic behavior along one direction and you understand it along the other direction, you can concatenate it to higher order behavior in in the joint yeah. with respect to the joint action and and it's and it's necessary. So the example shows that it's it's not we're we're not there's no redundancy. Um, okay, so so how can so 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 what is the uh, coming back to the question I had before? The question I had before was this this average that I was interested in, which was of this function h tilde of x x plus n m h of x plus n k h x plus n m plus k. I was looking at this average. And I said, we want to think of this as linear behavior. So I have this linear behavior in direction, linear in direction n times h, some n, n1 times, sorry, n times times m, m smaller or equal than square root of n. So this was hn1. And also linear behavior in direction hn2. I have these linear behavior with respect to these two directions, and I know that the sum of these two groups is very similar to this, the entire interval n, up to bounded multiplicity, it's the entire interval n. Then, um, then, then what I can get is global information, global info on h tilde, which gives us that h tilde, the global information is, um, H tilde has two step behavior along the full progression n. And and, and this, this we understand very well for primes. So what can we get out of this entire so uh, I've been thinking about this question for a long time because uh, uh, it's, it's a very natural question once you understand the existence of polynomial progressions. And when you try to attack this question using standard methods, you try to attack it using Fourier analysis, it's the, that's kind of the, the first thing you would be tempted to do, then um, you immediately see that, that, that you, you run in, the quantitative bounds are not good enough and, and you run into trouble. And the nice thing is somehow that you'd have, so, okay, so the, the nice thing is, is there is some reason to it. And the reason is that you needed to go you somehow need to go one step up in order to understand this. You need to go to two-step behavior in, uh, in order to understand this, uh, this linear behavior, this kind of local, local direction square root n linear behavior. You need to go one step up. Um, so for example, one, one consequence of this uh, would be um, For example, for the Mobius function, if mu is the Mobius function, um, then uh, mu doesn't have uh, any two-step behavior, any two-step behavior, or 
uh, I don't know, it doesn't have any, or it doesn't have two-step behavior, which means that it doesn't satisfy this condition over here, which means that if I want to calculate the average of the average, uh, let me write it in the average form that I wrote before, if I want to calculate the average of mu of n, mu, mu of x, mu of x plus n, mu of x plus n squared, then this is asymptotically the same with x goes up to n and n goes up to square root n, then this is asymptotically the same as the average of mu of x, mu of x plus n, same ranges, x. This is by what I wrote below, since I can, un if I understand that this is my function, this is the function h tilde that I had before, so it's average is zero, so it's the delta is zero <coughs> in this case, and, and this is well understood, so this is little o of one. So, so, uh, and similarly, uh, similarly, since this average for primes is well, on this average for primes is well understood, we can get an asymptotic behavior for this type of average for primes. Similarly, for primes, um, uh, can get an asymptotic, asymptotic of the average of lambda n. Lambda, lambda x, lambda x plus n, lambda x plus n squared, where lambda is the Fomangold function. Uh, n. So, so we can get similarly get using this concatenation type theorem, we can similarly get results for, for asymptotic behavior of of, uh, of of averages of this type for uh, for Mobius function for any arithmetic function which we understand the the, the nil po nil behavior of. Um, okay, so maybe um, I don't know when did I start. Maybe I should just say something about the the source. Huh? I have 15 minutes. Oh, oh! It's, uh, if, if, if we go up to an hour, okay. But no, nobody did this, so I won't <laughs> do this to you as well. But I want to, I want to so somehow say something about uh, the source of, 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 of this type of behavior. Why, why would one expect something like this to hold? So, so uh, it's, it's all based on a, on a the philosophy is, is, is very simple, the, the manifestation is somehow much more difficult, but, um, but the philosophy is, uh, I don't know how to spell that, so I won't, <laughs> uh, uh, is, uh, is as follows. Um, so here, here's a very simple fact, so simple, simple fact. Um, suppose you have a function f uh, in two variables, and um, and f uh, f is uh, a polynomial of degree um, smaller than k uh, in m. So suppose when I fix n, this things look like a polynomial of degree smaller than k, and a polynomial of degree smaller than l in n. So if I fix one of the variables, it's a polynomial, and I fix another variable, it's a polynomial of another degree. So we think of this as, as, as the, these two directions I'm going in. If I fix an ergodic component uh, along one direction, I can understand what happens, and, and, and along the other direction, I can understand as well. So it's very easy to see, then, then easy to see um, that f of mn as a function in two variables is a polynomial um, so let me write small or equal. Polynomial of degree, I think this works as well. So k plus l. So if it's a polynomial of degree, if, if you have, uh, and the way you prove it is, is very simple. It's just by, by inductively, you just take the different, you look at f of m plus m prime, n plus n prime minus f of m n, and you write this as a sum of two differences, and, and automatically you obtain that, um, yeah, this is f of n. I'll write this very short line, hopefully correctly. <coughs> plus this thing, m plus m prime, and minus f of mn. And inductively, each one of these creatures is going to be of lower degree. So 
I, fi I fix this. Sorry. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so depend. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so so it's very it's very easy it's very easy to see this uh, inductively by by writing this this difference over here. Um, so the question is how how can but but this is not the so the question is how is this simple fact related to to these norms? Well, these kind of norms, these U two norms or U K norms in general, are very strongly related to the notion of differentiation. So. Maybe there I can't explain it without being too technical, but let me, let me say something maybe about their ergodic point of view. Um, if, y if you have a nil system, then um, the nil systems in general are built out of nil systems um, are a tower of Abelian extensions, and and the cocycle extensions, and the cocycle extensions, the cocycles co defining the extensions of the extensions. Well, they're not quite polynomial, so so you can't quite apply anything like this to them. They're not quite polynomial, but they're sort of um, polynomial in cohomology. So once you can recognize in, in the cohomological world where, this, where you can see this type of property, then um, you, can, you can use this <coughs> kind of, uh, yeah, I, I can't, can't say m more than that, I think, uh, without, being, without being much more technical. But, but the idea is that this type of behavior, you can find it hidden inside, um, inside uh, uh, constructions of, of nil systems with when where the cocycles they're not quite polynomial but they behave in a, some form of poly they have some form of polynomial behavior sufficient to extract this kind of uh, or to to find a manifestation of this kind of property but i think uh, i think i'll stop Okay. <laughs> you have a question. Uh, uh, you can ask me later. <laughs>Yeah, well, not, not, a, not if you start with one-dimensional. Uh, yeah, I can construct them for you, but you need more dimensions. Yeah, yeah, but if I start with just Kronecker or Kronecker? No, but Kronecker one-dimensional, uh, of a one-dimensional torus, if you have a, a large, not, not a one-dimensional torus, yes, I can construct such for you. Okay, so Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not a problem with two-step system, which is truly Kronecker in both directions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I can show you. I have it written down, but I check that because it's an interesting question, right? Maybe, maybe it's always, maybe it's only truly, it's always truly polynomial, or, or maybe at least in this, in this case, it's truly polynomial. But, but no, I, yeah, you can construct examples where it's purely no polynomial. Yeah. 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 Yeah.